now, what I'd like to give you is what I think are the five major pieces to the life puzzle. Five major pieces to the life puzzle. If we can study each of the pieces and then put it all together, the chances of it running well are just a lot better. Mr. Shoff gave me a simple formula when I first met him, and let me give it to you. He said there's usually about a half dozen things makes 80% of the difference. There's about a half dozen wealth things, about a half dozen health things that can give you the 80% solution to the problem. Then Mr. Shove said, be a student of those half dozen basic things. Pretty good advice. Success is not doing extraordinary things. Success is doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. So if you just learn to do it well, key things well, learn to speak well. Poor people can talk and rich people can talk. Looks like rich people talk better. Uh, learning to speak is called survival. Learning to speak well is called success. So let me give you what I think are fundamental pieces to life and um, we'll take it from there. Here's the first one, philosophy. Philosophy in very simple terms is simply what you know. And what you know greatly affects how your life works out. We might also add what you don't know greatly affects how your life works out. The idea you miss could be the missing number in trying to put the numbers in the lock. So what you don't know will hurt you to correct an old cliche. And to correct another one, ignorance is not bliss. It's important to know. It's important to get the information. Now, we do something very important with what we know. We weigh it. That's another good word. We weigh. Weigh everything before you do it, before you buy it, before you try it. Make sure you weigh it. Everything you get ready to do, you got to decide whether it's a major or a minor. And you don't want to give minor things major time. You don't want to give something insignificant, significant amounts of your energy. So we simply use the phrase, weigh before you pay. Sophisticated people learn to weigh everything. And what we all need is a good set of mental scales to weigh everything. What if you got information and your mental scales were off and insignificant things to you were significant? Wouldn't that be a major handicap the rest of your life? When you weighed something, important things weighed unimportant. We would call that a great handicap. So it's very important to weigh everything properly. And that's the reason for sermons and songs and lyrics and lectures and seminars and, and conversations and professors and teachers. It's one of the reasons why we converse, we converse with each other and we debate and we think about and we ponder and we perceive and we weigh and and we try to find out where the values are. Because you don't want to proceed and give big chunks of your life to something that's insignificant. Okay, so we get information, we weigh it, then we come to conclusions about values. Big question in forming your life, where are the values? What is important? What should weigh heavy on my mind and I should give it significant time and significant energy and significant money? Shove said to me, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. They don't use their mind to really try to perceive where the values are so that they don't waste any time. It's easy to spend big chunks of your life on insignificant things. It's one of the major pieces of the life puzzle. What you think about. Knowledge. How you weigh it. The conclusions you come to. The values you perceive thinking. If you really want to help somebody change their life, you have to start changing their mind, change their philosophy, change how they think. Somebody says, well, just motivation, that'll do. And the answer is no, motivation won't do it. If a guy's an idiot, then you motivate him, you got a motivated idiot. Right? <laughs> I say, no, that, that's not what it takes. Now, it's very easy to make errors in judgment. Errors in judgment. I'm now that teaching people, even, out of, even, even after they're out of school, university, college, they should read at least uh, one or two books a week. It's easy when you get out of school, right, and get a job to just sort of let that all slide, not keep up the learning process. But if you don't keep up the learning process, a lot of values become fuzzy if you don't keep trying to perceive what's important, what's not important. And then start spending major effort on minor things. 
so we have to keep learning. What if a guy spent his book money on donuts? Right? We would call him greatly deprived mentally. In 10 years, the guy's bought two tons of donuts and only two books, right? Mostly with pictures, right? And he wonders why his life isn't working well. Reason. After he got out of school, he didn't keep up the flow of ideas that can help to refine your business and help to refine your decisions and help you come to better conclusions. You've got to keep up the learning curve, even after you're out of school, to make sure that you're not making errors in judgment. The reason why most people wind up average at age 40 instead of rich is simply an error in judgment about what to do with your money. What would you suggest a 15-year-old start as a plan to do with their money so that by 40 they're rich instead of average? You've got to have a good plan, right? If you start making errors early with your money, those errors can, uh, can make your life mediocre instead of rich. You wind up with pennies instead of fortune. And you wind, you wind up with crumbs instead of a feast, simply because early you made errors on what to do with your money. The guy says, well, it's only $10. So what does it matter what I do with it? And the answer is, it, 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 that's when it really matters is when you don't have much. The guy says, oh, if I had a fortune, I'd really take good care of it, but I've only got a paycheck, so I don't know where it goes. We call those great errors in judgment. It's so important to make sure you've got a good plan when the amounts are small. But it's easy to make errors. It's easy not to know. It's easy to miscalculate. And if you miscalculate, some things keep adding and adding and adding. I got a good phrase for you. Life is accumulative. Good phrase to know. Life is accumulative. Our errors either accumulate into what we don't get, or our wise decisions accumulate into what we do get. Now, the key is to correct the errors as early as possible. Fortunately, Mr. Shove caught me at age 25, started asking me major questions. At age 25, he said, Mr. Owen, how long have you been working? And I said, I've been working uh, six years. I started working when I was 19. He said, well, six years. How much money have you saved and invested in the last six years? I said, not any. He said, who sold you on that plan? Wow, six years is, is enough time now to check and see if you've got a good financial philosophy. And the time to catch the errors is early, early. So Mr. Shoff started asking me those tough questions at age 25. How about your money? How about your resources? How about your investments? And you say, well, I, I've got plenty of time to worry about that and be concerned about that later. And the answer is probably not. Now's the time to fix it. Wherever you hear the good information, that's the time to start fixing. So we're teaching kids now a good wealth philosophy starting at age 50. 15 will make you wealthy by age 40, 45 at the latest if you're a little slow. Start doing wise things with your resources. When, when would you suggest people should do wise things with their resources? Answer, as soon as they get the better information. Now you can't do what you don't know, but the key is to keep learning so that good ideas keep occurring to you, now you can do more wise things, okay? But philosophy is where it all begins, what you know. Now, to know wise things, you simply have to study, as you're doing, keep up the reading, keep up the conversations, keep up the listening to lectures, keep going through the information, keep stashing it away, taking the notes, right? There's no better way to adjust your philosophy and to have a continual flow of ideas. But that's the first piece of the life puzzle, philosophy. Now, here's number two. Philosophy determines attitude. Attitude is simply how you feel. First, what you know sets the sail of your life. Now, how you feel starts taking you there. Attitude. Now, there's all kinds of ways to feel, right? You can feel good or you can feel bad. Here's one attitude. If this is all they pay, I'm not coming early and I'm not staying late on the job. That's an attitude, right? If this is all they pay, I don't come early and I don't stay late. Now, do you suppose that that attitude, if you carried it through the rest of your life, do you suppose that attitude would greatly affect your life as the years unfold? The answer is, overwhelmingly, 
Of course. Here's another attitude. No matter what they pay, I always come early and I always stay late to invest in my own future. Isn't that fascinating? Attitude is by choice. You can either choose to come early or you can choose to come late. You can either choose to leave early or you can choose to stay late. Attitude's a matter of choice. Now, to make wise choice, we need educated attitudes. Emotions must go to school to learn where the values are. Okay, good phrase. Emotions must go to school. When kids are young, right? A three-year-old, you know, falls on the floor and kicks his feet and screams. We say, well, that's okay when you're three, but it isn't okay when you're 30. Right? As a little kid, right, you can retaliate and punch somebody out, but when you're 23, we say, no, no, you've got to learn now to take that emotion and send it to school and find out where the values are. It's okay to feel strong, but you've got to learn to restrain yourself in a society if you want life to go well for you. So attitudes now become a matter of educated choice, educated choice. But how we feel is going to greatly determine how our life works out. Now, it's how you feel about a variety of things. Let me give you that list. Number one, it's how you feel about the past. Now, when you're young, you haven't got that much past to feel about, but I'm sure you've had some ups and downs. You've had some wins and losses. So part of our attitude is based on how we feel about the past. Some people are still carrying the burdens of the past. They're affected by some difficulties, some losses, whatever. They're carrying it around like a burden. Instead of using the past as a school, uh, they're using it as a threat to their life. So part of it is solving the attitude about the past, how you feel about it. Number two, it's how you feel about the future. Facing the future, very important key part of our life. Now there's two ways to face the future. Here they are. One, anticipation. That's one way to face the future, anticipation. Here's the other way, apprehension. Now, most people face the future with apprehension, primarily because they bought somebody else's view. They don't have their own future well designed. So in the absence of having your own future well designed, you have a tendency to be persuaded to buy somebody else's future. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Boy, it's easy to let your days be clouded by all of that. So some days, somewhere along the line, you've got to start settling for sure how you feel about the future. And how you feel about it greatly determines what you do. If you don't feel good about the future by having goals set, you take what we call uncertain steps. It's difficult to be confident about the day if you don't have your future well designed. So here's one of the keys to do about your future. Set goals, write them down, design the future. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? What do you want to have? What do you want to share? Even if it all changes 12 months from now, the key is to start making a list now. The cities you want to visit, the people you'd like to meet, your health goals, your investment goals, all that stuff, start writing it, putting it in a journal somewhere. And let it all change as time unfolds. Something that you think is very important right now, two years from now, you'll say, that was kind of foolish. How come I thought that was so important, right? Because you'll grow beyond that. But right now it's important to get as clear a picture of you can, as you can of the future. Set your dreams, set your goals. Because it's important how the day goes is greatly determined by your confidence about the future. Now here's another attitude. It's how you feel about each other. It's how you feel about society and the community and the country. It's very important. It's not that difficult to be a cynic. And cynicism greatly influences how your life works out. But it's also important to understand that if you want to do well, it takes all of us to help each of us. Good phrase. It takes all of us to help each of us do well. You can't succeed by yourself. It's hard to find a rich hermit. You can't succeed by yourself. You need a market. You need a society. We need each other's ideas. We need each other's collective ideas. Collective participation in the marketplace, society. Okay. So how we feel about each other, very important. 
Now here's the big one. It's how you feel about yourself. How you feel about yourself. Self-esteem, understanding your own value. Boy, if new discovery starts to unfold for you, that you've got the brains, you've got the talent, all you need is instruction, all you need is some coaching, all you need is some help, all you need is some advice, some experience. If you're headed down the wrong road, hopefully somebody's already been down that road where the bridge is out. And they come back saying, don't go this way anymore, the bridge is out. So we take somebody else's advice and we say, wow, I'm glad you came along, I'm heading down this road. So learning from other people's experiences, picking up all the ideas so that we can feel good about ourselves. Now self-esteem primarily becomes from, comes from engaging in the disciplines that lead to value. Self-esteem comes from engaging in the disciplines that lead to value. We don't lack potential, but to bring value from potential, we need the disciplines. Now one of the major things that makes us not feel good about ourselves is not engaging in the disciplines. If you keep letting yourself off the hook, or just ho-humming it and letting it all slide, then you don't feel good about yourself. Best is the ant philosophy, right? To feel good about yourself, do your best, gather all you can during the summer. We call that the ant philosophy. Ants don't settle for half, they go for all. All you possibly can, do the best you can. It's the greatest lift of self-esteem is doing the best you can. Okay, so attitude plays such an important part in the five pieces of the life puzzle. Now, what's next? Number three. First is philosophy. Second is attitude. Philosophy and attitude determines activity. Activity is what you do. Key phrase, success is a doing. You actually now have to do it. It seems as though God has designed that the major part of the value of our life is, less to, is left to our own mental genius. You've got to decide what you want to become. Then you simply have to go do it, engaging in the disciplines. Now the activity part is so important. How hard should you work when you get ready to labor, when you get ready to try to be successful in the marketplace? How many days should you spend? How hard should you work? Well, let me give you an Old Testament phrase to consider. It says, six days activity, one day rest. Now that's called a philosophy on activity. Right? What should be the ratio of rest to activity? Old Testament suggests six one. Now I know that goes back a long ways. Some people said, no, six, six one's old fashioned. Five two is better. Well, you've got to take a look at 5.2 and see if it's okay. You don't just want to buy somebody's philosophy without seeing if it, if it leads to fortune and if it leads to unique things. Wonderful, it's probably good. But you have to check out if 5.2 is okay. Would 4.3 uh, be better? I don't know. You've got to check everything. I do know this. Good phrase. Don't rest too long. i got a good point for you. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. The objective of, of life is not to rest. The objective of life is to accomplish, to growth, full growth, full accomplishment, test the outer limits of your abilities. That's what life is all about. See what all you can do. That's what life is all about. See what you can do with the seasons and the soil and the seed. See what you can do with your brains. See what you can do with your talent and your gifts and your skills. That's what life is all about. See what you can do. Now we need rest, but you must make rest a necessity, not an objective. If you make it an objective, you start falling into what we call the average syndrome, right? People who live mediocre lives are always looking forward to getting off. Successful people are always looking forward to getting on. Successful people don't want off. They want on. They want to get on with the job. They rest only enough to gather strength. So consider that in your argument, in your debate on how hard should you work. Let me give you another Bible philosophy. I'm, my parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by the time I was 18. And I'm an amateur on the Bible. But here's another good philosophy. Whatever your hands currently find to do, do it with all your might. Whatever you're doing, 
do it with all your mind. We call that philosophy on activity. How hard should you work? As hard as you can in the time allotted to labor. In leadership, management, lectures we teach. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't play at work. And don't work at play. Right? Make best use of your time. When you're working, pour it on. And when you're playing, have a good time. But don't play at work. Okay. So, activity. Very important piece in this whole life puzzle in working. So, you've got to test how hard you can work. Part of it is physical, your own physical limitations. Some people can take 14 hours, no problem. Some people 10 stretches pretty much their physical limitation. So everybody has to sort of decide how hard you can work, how much time you can put in. When you come to university, right? You got to sort of find out how much workload you can handle, how many classes can you go through, how much can you unravel, how many study hours do you need, how much effort have you got, when are you going to run out of gas, right? And you need to replenish the supply. So we all have to study our own activity habits. But let me give you what I think is the best philosophy. It is simply do the best you can. In activity, we call it doing your best. A man asked me one time, he said, I'm making about $50,000 a year, isn't that enough? What would you tell somebody? A businessman said to me, he said, my kids aren't starving, and he said, I got my bills paid, and he said, we're doing pretty good, and I'm making about $50,000 a year, isn't that enough? He asked me, what do you suppose I told him? I said, yes, it's enough if it's the best you can do. We don't call an amount enough. We call your best enough. I said, if you're capable of making a half million dollars a year and you make $50,000 a year, we call you loser. And we don't call you loser because of the difference between 50,000 and a half million. We call you loser because you're not doing your best. If you do your best and you make 10,000 a year, that's enough. If you do your best and you make a million dollars a year, that's enough. Enough is not the difference between 10,000 and a million. Enough is simply doing the best you can. So that's the key to the good life. When the day is finished, if you say, did I do my best? And if I'm not doing my best, why not? Do I, have I got some errors in my philosophy that says, hey, half effort's okay. Just slide by, ho-hum it, cross your fingers and everything will work out, hopefully. Say, no, I don't want to take those kind of chances. I don't want to drift, okay? So activity. Just put a big question mark on activity and say, here's a major piece of life to keep checking. Make sure I'm doing my best. That's all I require, my best. A group of psychiatrists asked me to come and lecture for them in Los Angeles one time, which I thought was interesting since I only went to one year of college. And then in the middle of my lecture, I had the audacity to say, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what I think most messes with the mind. They said, what do you think most messes with the mind? I said, I think what most messes with the mind is simply doing less than you can. It sets up all kinds of psychic problems, doing less than you can. Guess when you really feel good about yourself? When you've done the best you can. You don't even have to win the full prize if you do the best you can. We call that the ultimate winning, doing the best you can. Wow, there's no, nothing like the soaring self-confidence that comes from putting out what we call full effort in whatever you do. It's called full effort. Philosophy, activity, attitude leads to number four, results. And that's what life is all about. Putting the first three together, good philosophy, attitude, high activity to get the ultimate called results. I got a good phrase for you. Results is the name of the game. Now the challenge of life is a very simple phrase. Let me give it to you. I think you'll find it interesting to at least ponder. The challenge of life is to make measurable progress in reasonable time. Measurable progress in reasonable time. First, we don't want to be unreasonable with time. If you and I agree to do something, five minutes later I'm asking you, how are you doing? You say, I haven't left the building yet. You can't ask in five minutes. Five minutes is too soon. That's unreasonable. Now, if I don't ask you for five years, 
We call that too late. You can't wait five years and you can't go five minutes. Right? You, we all have to learn what is reasonable time to expect somebody to make progress, to grow, to change, to develop. So all of us have to learn, especially if you're going to become leaders, entrepreneurs, if you're going to have management responsibilities and work with people, you got to understand what is reasonable time. We don't want to be unreasonable with time. But here's what else we expect. Measurable progress in reasonable time. How many years should the child spend in fourth grade? Approximately. About one. You say, well, if they're nice kids, would you give them three or four? You say, no, you can't spend four years in fourth grade. It's unacceptable. We put on the family pressure. We put on peer pressure, right? We put on all kinds of pressure. You can't spend four years in fourth grade. Now, wouldn't that be interesting if we applied the same kind of social pressure all of our lives? What would be acceptable to society for wise investments to have been made by age 30 so that you can really properly take care of yourself and your family. Somehow we've missed those standards, right? Shouldn't it be popular to be wealthy by age 40? And shouldn't we look at somebody who by age 45 is not at least financially independent saying, where have you been, uh, Tibet or uh, Bangladesh you probably have spent you mean you've been here all this time? Right? Shouldn't we make it a bit unacceptable not to be well off in what we call reasonable time? But what if a guy spent his potential fortune on non-essentials from age 15 to age 45? Shouldn't we call that unacceptable? Shouldn't teenagers ask their parents, how come we're not rich? We live in a rich country. This is America. Aren't those good questions? How about the wisdom of a good plan versus a poor plan? What if a man was a farmer and he ate his seed corn? Instead of planting it, he ate it. Wouldn't we make arrangements to go get his children? And say, the kids aren't safe. The man's insane. He eats his seed corn, he doesn't plant it. Wow, I just offer that as kind of an interesting question. If we make such pressure demands for fourth grade, why shouldn't we make those same pressure demands for the rest of life? Interesting question, right? Good debatable question. Now part of it is we simply, society eases back on us as far as ongoing demand of results. But here's what I'd ask you to do. Make the demands on yourself. I'm asking you not to let yourself off the hook. Society will let you get by with far less than you want to be. When you get out of university, how many books will the community demand that you read every month? Approximately. About none. So if you're going to do the extra reading, guess what? You've got to develop that philosophy and put that pressure on yourself. But what I'm asking you to do is take a good look at results. Now, another reason why we look at results, results at age 25, results at age 30 on a wide variety of things, health and wealth and culture and, and sophistication and lifestyle and uniqueness. We keep checking all those results. Here's why. To see if there's any errors in activity. Guess how easy it is to make errors in activity? It's easy. We teach in our leadership series, don't mistake movement for achievement. Boy, sometimes it's easy to be faked out by being busy. Guy's busy 10 hours a day, but he's going in figure eights. The guy's not making progress. He's stalled, but he's busy. And he thinks being busy is going to do it. Say, no, you got to be busy doing the right things. So maybe you need activity fixed. Maybe you need attitude fixed. Who knows? The guy who says, since they don't pay well, I come late and leave early. We say, John, that's going to affect you all your life. And you've probably got the results to show it. Or maybe we need a correction of philosophy. That's why we check results. Now here's the last piece in the life puzzle. It's called lifestyle. Lifestyle is simply how you choose to live. We call lifestyle the genius of living well. 
Now, here's what's exciting about lifestyle. As a subject of one of the major pieces of the life puzzle, all of us can choose, especially in this country, all of us can choose how we wish to live. Guess what you can get from your money? Joy or animosity? However you wish to live. A father takes a $10 bill and wads it up and throws it at his son and says, if you need the darn stuff that bad, take it. We call it money without style. The father's got the money, but he doesn't have the style. He studied economics, but he didn't study happiness. So let me give you the phrase. Happiness is an art, not an accident. Some people have figured out things economically, but they haven't figured out lifestyle to live well. Culture is a study. It's not an amount. Somebody says, if you have an amount of money, you'll be cultured. And the answer is no. Cultured is a study. Cultured, culture is a refinement of the mind. To be cultured, you must study culture and practice culture. Money doesn't solve the culture challenge. Money doesn't solve the happiness challenge. To be happy, you got to study and practice happiness. And Mr. Shove taught me all the simple ways to get joy from substance. A sophisticated gentleman knows that a rose on time is more valuable than a thousand dollar gift too late. It's not the amount that counts, it's the genius that counts. It's the ideas that count. So here's what I'm challenging you to do. How to be happy with what you've got while you pursue what you want. And I'll give you time to make a note of that phrase because I think it's so important to wrap it up. How to be happy with what you've got while you pursue what you want. So I would challenge you in the last piece of the life puzzle, find ways to live uniquely. Now, if you look at your life on all these five pieces, this is why I'm asking you to just go back through and review these notes. How am I doing on philosophy? Are there some things I don't know? Am I making some errors in judgment that's going to bring me to no good end, right? Three years from now, five years from now. Key phrase, 10 years from now, you will arrive. The question is where? Good question, where? And the follow-up is, now's the time to fix the next 10 years. Now's the time to fix the next 10 years and hopefully with the discussion of these, these five subjects we've given you some uh, viewpoints at least from my experience and uh, hopefully I've done a little coaching here today and you can take these subjects and debate them and talk about them and think about them and they'll help you with life in the future.